Welcome, it's just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday the 29th of September and you are watching Regional Wrap, episode 24. Regional Wrap, providing an insight to issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates. Joining me on this episode, will the growth of minor political parties benefit regional Australia? Is my guest, the Honourable Robert Bozo. Mem member of the Legislative Council of New South Wales and leader of the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. Robert entered the New South Wales Legis Legislative Council in 2010, filling the vacancy caused by the death of Roy Smith of the Shooters and Fishers Party and has since been re-elected. He is no career politician, having done the hard yards in the real world. After winning a company cadetship with Walton Stores, he studied part-time at night at the University of Technology, Sydney, for a degree in business studies, majoring in accounting. Robert has had a dynamic business career, working for News Limited, Coopers and Lybrand, Woods Ward Steel, and international insurance broking company, Lowndes Lambert. Has been an investor, owner, consultant to dozens of private companies employing hundreds of staff, earning over tens of millions of dollars per year. Primarily involved in steel and aluminium fabrication, manufacturing, computer software and system solution. Under Robert's leadership, the Tudors, Fishers and Farmers Party campaigned on a bias for the bush agenda during the 2019 New South Wales state election, achieving its best result ever winning three lower house seats. Welcome, Robert. Yeah, hi, Bill. Thanks very much. If we could just start with a little bit of your earlier background. Uh, obviously, you had very interesting parents uh, coming out of Europe uh, from World War II and then having the experience of actually being born in Australia, but then going back to Poland a as a child. Um, so can you give us a bit of a background on yourself? Well, yeah, sure. Um, from a business point of view, you gave me a nice potted summary there. As far as my younger years were concerned, my parents uh, got here in 1949, in January 49, uh, and came from Holland. My father's actually Polish and my mother's Dutch, so that's a bit of a mixture. Uh, my father spent uh, three and a half years or three and a bit years uh, at the uh, as a guest of the Nazis in uh, various concentration camps during the war. Uh, he... Um, he was imprisoned there as a political prisoner, um, managed to survive, ended up in uh, Buchenwald, um, uh, Dora subcamp, escaped from there, uh, was found by the Americans in the in the forest. That was in about, I think, 1945, yeah, because D-Day was 44. Um, spent the next two and a bit years uh, in the American army, of all things, uh, in the occupation army. Uh, came out of there as a captain in 1948. Uh, no, sorry, 1947. Um, he he uh, he didn't want to. He didn't want to. He couldn't go back to Poland. It was at, at that stage, of course, been handed over to the communists. Uh, he refused to go back there. Uh, otherwise, they would have just put him up against the wall and shot him. Uh, so someone said to him, uh, you know, after he, he got an honourable discharge from the Americans because they said we're going home. He said, I want to go to America. And they said, no, no, we're not taking any Americans. Uh, sorry, non-Americans, no immigration. <laughs> We've got millions and millions of American soldiers to bring back and resettle and give them jobs and everything. So anyway, he ended up in Holland. Um, my father was a tailor by trade. Uh, so he, he could always, always do something with his hands and survive. And that's how he got through the camps. Um, met my mother, got married. Around about the time they were having the Berlin blockade. Decided he didn't want to stay in Europe anymore. Uh, wanted to get as far away from Europe as he could. So he, uh, he and mum applied for uh, visas to come to Australia, to Argentina and, um, and South Africa. And uh, the Australian visas came through first. So after all that bad luck, after all those years mm -hmm. and just surviving the war, he, uh, he came to the best country on earth. And uh, anyway, they got here, as I said, in January 49. And then I was born in 1953. By 1963, my father decided he wanted to go and he was very homesick. Uh, he hadn't obviously been back to Poland since he was picked up by the Nazis. So we ended up there in 63. 
spent three years there, came back to Australia. Uh, I was really happy to be back in Australia, to tell you the truth. Um, really unusual turning up in communist Poland in the, in the early 60s um, as a schoolboy. Uh, my brother and my sister also. Um, and we had it pretty good there. So, uh, yeah, and that's and then we came back. I live in Sydney, always have. Um, finished my schooling here at the local public school. Um, went and uh, did, did my university part-time while I had a full-time job. Uh, and uh, got fully qualified as an, a, as an accountant, a CPA, tax agent, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I've always been, and for probably 50 years, been a shooter and a hunter primarily. Uh, done a fair bit of fishing too over the years. Um, and uh, my interest in politics really got fired up uh, in the early 90s uh, as gun laws started to change in New South Wales. Uh, we started, we saw the introduction by RAN of shooters' licenses. Uh, and then we just saw the things tighten and tighten and tighten. 1992 came along, um, John Tingle set up the Shooters Party. Uh, I joined the Shooters Party pretty soon thereafter. Uh, by 1995, I was chairman of the party, the shoot, well, then just the Shooters Party in those days. John got elected to Parliament, uh, stayed there until about 2006, I think it was. Um, and uh he was replaced by another fellow by the name of robert brown uh robert stayed there until 2019 and uh i i stayed in the background i actually never had any intention of actually going into parliament itself at, the, at you know at the sharp end in parliament house I, I, i've been involved in the party as treasurer and as chairman um and those sorts of things organizational side of, side of things um but then as you said in the uh in your early a prologue that um, he, uh, one of our members, our second member, got elected in 2017. Sorry, 2007, and uh, Roy died suddenly um, in 2010. And I was I was then chairman of the party, and they asked me what I'd like to take over. I had basically semi-retired from full-time work in 2002. Um, I was having a great old time going fishing and shooting all the time. It was just fantastic. <laughs> Anyway, I thought, oh yeah, why not? I'll give it a go. So I, I went into parliament in 2010. We had an election in 2011 um, and uh, I served out the rest of his term, which which ended in 2015 when I went up for re-election, uh, got re-elected and uh, 2019 it was the last election we had. Robert B Brown retired before the election. Um, we had a, a new member, young fellow by the name of Mark Benassiak come in um, we got the highest ever upper house vote. Uh, I think it was 5.6% or something of the statewide vote we got. Because um, in New South Wales, the, the upper house, you don't have an upper house in, in Queensland, but here we do. And it's a, it's a statewide franchise. It's uh, all votes, all comers, basically. Um, and uh, it's done on a quota basis. So there's half half the house gets elected each each uh, eight year or every four years, sorry, and you get elected for an eight year term in New South Wales. So uh, you're looking at uh, I think it's 21 members get elected every four years, and so you've got a quota of about 4.4 percent to guarantee a spot. And as I say, we've got about 5.6 percent, which is the highest vote we've ever had. And at the same time, we um, we won the seat of Murray, which runs uh, along the New South Wales and Victorian border primarily. We won the seat of Barwon, which is the largest uh, largest electorate in the state. And uh, we also retained and improved our our, um, our uh, majority in, in Orange, the seat of Orange, which is also, of course, centered around Orange and Parks in that area there. So yeah, that's a, a very potted history of how I got to where I am right now, sitting here talking to you. <laughs> in um last year the IPA ran a, um, a study uh, they wouldn't have bold who they ran it on behalf of but it was talking about looking at reintroducing the upper house to Queensland now as you say in New South Wales it's just everyone in the pot across the whole state um, Victoria is slightly different it's broken up into I think eight eight sections uh, there's five five divisions within the greater metropolitan area, and then there's three divisions spread across the uh, north, northeast, north, and northwest. 
Uh, but because of the population situation and the density in Melbourne, some of those uh, what you'd call regional provinces have actually had to creep in a bit towards the city to pick up enough um, voters to, to fill their requirements sort of thing. So we've got situations in uh, there where you're sort of <laughs> you're getting within 60 kilometres of, of Melbourne with those, those normally uh, regional type provinces. Uh, so that, that's one system they looked at. And of course, yours is just all in one pot. And basically, when they looked at the at both systems, it wasn't <laughs> the New South, New South Wales sort of system allows, of course, to where everyone who's in the pot for being in the uh, upper house or a legislative council could all actually live in Sydney. Like, <laughs> no, you know, there's, there's because you don't have to, there's no requirements to be in a, any particular area. You could have a situation where all, all uh, is it 42? members of the Alpha House mm. could all live in, in a city in in the Sydney area or something like that. So they wouldn't really wouldn't be really represented of representative of of regional New South Wales. With Victoria it was a little bit better, but still didn't really give any clout to regional. And I've had Tim Quilty on this show from the Liberal Democrats and it still basically works out. It's it's pretty hard yards to sort of get the regional the regional um, interests ac across to the um, into the parliament. So a new having an upper house sometimes it's no real advantage. So well, look, I mean, in New South Wales, it's as as fair as it can get. It's one vote, one value, uh, and uh, it's up to uh, it's up to certainly the major parties. Put the put the Liberal Nats apart because the Nats obviously they go after their seats in the bush. Uh, the major parties tend to try to put uh, country people in their tickets into, but obviously they don't put them in the winnable spots in, in their tickets because uh, we've got a, in New South Wales we've got above the line and below the line voting as well, ticket voting. Um, in our particular case, I mean our party identifies as a party for the bush, um, and uh, what what has changed for us is that we were up until 2016 we were a, a strictly upper house party we always used to <clears throat> only focus every four years on trying to win seats or retain seats in the upper house uh, but come 2016 we decided to have a crack at uh, in a by-election for the seat of orange based on the things that were going on in uh, in new south wales and those things were primarily two major things were happening under Baird in those days as Premier of New South Wales. First of all, it was the forced council amalgamations. Um, for the life of me, I don't understand why he forced a very large number of councils in the bush to amalgamate when they were all, I think all except one, were found uh, in the review process to be fit for purpose, yet they just forced it. I get why they wanted to force amalgamations in Sydney uh, Greater Sydney, because it's all about property development. And if you can get rid of the number of councils, you can force through more development dollars and more development of properties. And, you know, we've got probably like Brisbane and other places, we've, we've still got a boom going on here in Sydney, building units all over the place. But I just don't get why, for example, uh, Tumbarumba Shire had to be forcibly amalgamated with Tumut. There were, uh, you know, and what's coming out of that now since 2015, 16, is that those force councils now, certainly in the bush, almost all of them are now having really bad financial problems. Uh, and they were supposed to have been given money to fix all this and there was all a lot of nonsense uh, numbers put together to prove that all this would work. But in the end of the day, no one could figure out politically why this was done. So based on that, plus we had really the first indication of the Liberal Party bias towards animal liberation and that was uh, Baird decided along with a couple of his other uh, North Shore uh, trendies and elitists they were simply going to ban greyhound racing that's it bang got up on Facebook one day uh, had a rush of shit to the head and said oh you're all despicable go away uh, I'm banning you from tomorrow 12 months from now you won't exist and then that was a, re that was a result of uh, um, ABC uh, was it uh uh, for, well, there, there was there was a four corners show on, but that four wasn't the only, that wasn't the only thing. <clears throat> the reality is that the people in the industry 
uh, there were extremely small, tiny minority of people were doing the wrong thing. And of course, and, and a, lot, a lot of the incidents that they portrayed on, they're actually happening in Queensland. They weren't happening in New South Wales. But uh, anyway, New South Wales copped it in, uh, in the neck over this announced ban. Um, well, we, we campaigned against it. Uh, there was an accidental um, by-election in the seat of Orange. Uh, Andrew G, who's now a federal uh, member, uh, re re retired from his seat, quit his seat, and ran at the federal election to get elected at the federal level, which he did. And we ran for the by-election. And really those two issues, plus some more local issues in Orange, um, we managed to win the seat by, I think it was 56 votes on about the 15th count. Um, that's how what close about it this was. Time? Uh, we got we got 49, I think about 49 and a half percent primary in the first count. So there was, there was no doubt. We were, so we went from 56 votes to nearly 50 percent of the vote. That shows how <laughs> on the nose the National Party are in New South Wales, and that and that's only going to get worse for them. I think I think um, it's qu quite concerning because the situation is fairly similar in Queensland in regards to we had the amalgamation in about 2008 and the National Party basically just withdrew from regional uh, north north and central Queensland. Uh, the cat has moved in over the time. Uh, uh, we already had Bob in the in the federal seat. Uh, they uh, picked up Traeger, then uh, what was called Hill uh, El Rempel, uh, which is now basically Hill. And in 2017, they picked up their third seat, Hinchinbrook, with Nick, Nick Meadow, which was a very interesting um, result in uh, 2017, where De Meadow only got 20, 20 points, I think 20.6 of the primary vote. Um, but but the Liberal, national Liberal guy there was so on the nose, I think his name, Andrew Cripps, I think he only came in at 18%. And, uh, and so uh, Mick, Nick Nabeto got into the second position. The uh, preferences flowed to him. And then being in that second position, the LNP vote flow, flowed to him. And so he got over the line with, again, just a marginal, I think, just in that 50, between 50 and 51 percent on the two, two party preferred system after the preferences. But um, the last election is in solid, like he's done, he's, he's, mm. he's done the right thing by the people, he's only spruiking about his region, um, regional Queensland, what it needs. It's it's being not tied to a, a Brisbane headquartered political party he's been able to sort of concentrate and get that vote consolidated very much like in orange so it's, it's our, our preferential system is is doing wonders in regards to as the as the um, primary votes for the um my two majors starts to get knocked back it's starting to give opportunities to small parties um, to get that flow through of preferences um, where it just automatically throws through anyway. But again, it, it probably would be better if they could actually negotiate some uh, preference deals or something like that uh, to enhance the position. But did you see this as a growing opportunity for good organized small political parties? Well, look, every state's different. Um, in New South Wales, uh, in the lower house, uh, it's, uh, it's optional preferential. So say you have five candidates in New South Wales, uh, you can just mark the ticket one. That's it. Uh, it's the voter that decides where the preferences go uh, in New South Wales. So it's very much in the hands of the voter. You see a lot of lies. The National Party love to run the line that uh, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, we, we offer preferences to Labor and Labor preferences us. Well, that's simply not true. Um, we don't offer preferences to Labor or get Labor preferences any more than the, the Nationals would get uh, preferences from uh, other independents. The, the problem with the Nationals in New South Wales is that 
for the first time in their 100 years, or at least that I know of, uh, there actually is a political party of the bush that is self-sustaining and a party, not an individual independent. Uh, the way they've survived in New South Wales is, and we've had lots, a long history of independence in New South Wales, they're usually ex-nationals that are dissatisfied with the National Party and go off and, you know, do their own thing. Uh, and they may last one term, two terms, three terms, but eventually they go and then the Nationals swing in out of the trees again, making all sorts of promises, which they then subsequently break. But for the first time, they're actually having to come up against a real party that actually is campaigning on a bias for the bush. I don't care what Sydney wants. I don't care what the Labor Party wants. I don't care what the Liberal Party wants. Uh, unlike, the, unlike the Nationals, we don't have to tug the forelock to the boss, which is the Liberal Party. And uh, we just don't have to do it. So the reality is a lot of promises are made. There's been an incredible amount of money pork barreled into the New South Wales electorates. And it's continuing. You've got no idea how much money was tipped into the last election, came out of various potholes, uh, secret, secret pockets of the government. Uh, um, and we're going to see the same in the run-up to the next election. Uh, we've got our next election in March uh, 2023. So next year is the last year. Uh, Parliament will rise in New South Wales at the end of November. We'll come back in early February. But by September, we're six months out. That's when the campaign process starts, the statutory campaign. So it's going to be an interesting time. But the failing now of the national is... Uh, they can't really present their own independent policies for Bush or regional regional Australia, as I prefer to call it. No, because no. They, they are just too too tied to the Liberals. And although they might might make a bit of a song and dance about you know we're going to look after the we're the voice of the regions, <laughs> blah blah blah, they always all seem always seem to roll over to whatever the, the policy is that the Lives are pushing. Do you think it's fair to say if if you're trying to, I mean, in Queensland the situation is there's roughly 73 seats in that greater southeast Queensland um, area, and there's 20 sort of regional seats um, that are more than you know, a little bit more than 200 kilometres away from, away from Brisbane. Do you think it's possible? That, if, if you're trying to win uh, as much as you can and you need to in that Sydney or Brisbane, you can actually write policies that are both in the best interests of the people in, uh, in our instance, South East Queensland, and then at the same time in the best interests of people in regional Queensland. And in your situation, in the in parties trying to win those 70 odd seats in around Sydney, right policy to satisfy both camps, or is it just impossible because there's such a difference? The, the, the difference between now between a person and their expectations in regional uh, areas of Australia versus the expectations of people in the in capital cities and their um, satellite city, cities are so different. Oh, look, I think I think what we see in New South Wales is, and every country seat has got uh, its own issues. Uh, some of them, for example, uh, Albury, uh, are very, very well catered for. Others, uh, you take the seat of Murray or Barwon, um, uh, Orange to a lesser degree, but there are many, many country seats where they simply don't have acceptable uh, health outcomes. They just, you know, they just don't have decent hospitals. Uh, doctors are in short supply. Mental health facilities basically don't exist. Uh, intensive care facilities, you know, the biggest thing that we're worried about here at the moment is what's going to happen if this COVID really gets cracking in the in the bush. Uh, you know, they'll come out of lockout in, lockdown in Sydney. People will start moving to Sydney. You might go, I was talking to um, Helen Dalton the other day about uh, the seat of Murray, and I think in the whole seat of Murray, they have, I think it's five intensive care beds that where they could handle uh, COVID patients. And you're talking about a seat that runs from almost just outside of Albury all the way up to Wentworth. Uh, and that's, you know, that huge, big, long strip 
of the border of um, between Victoria and New South Wales. And, you know, there are other issues there too related to COVID, which I won't bore you with now, but uh, then you've got education. Education's not equal. Then you go to, to policing. That's not equal. Uh, roads, you know, access to, uh, you know, pensions and, and grants and all sorts of things. I mean, it just goes on and on. What, what the nationals have always dwelled on, and that they did this at the last election, is that it's all about treating country people like mushrooms, throwing money at them. Oh, we'll get you a new bridge. We'll get you a new sporting ground. We'll give you a new, you know, a local scout hall. We'll, you know, all sorts of things. We'll give you things all the time, things, little trinkets, we promise you. And then they spend a lot of that money in the run up to the next election. But what they don't do, they don't fix policy. And so in theory, you've got one size fits all. You've got one size fits all. So what they should be doing is, is making what they should be doing is making policy that fits the regions now. And it just shouldn't be, oh well, what's good for Sydney? We'll then give it the same to the bush. But they don't do that, of course. They the way they measure that is based on a per head spend and that is probably about the same or even less so you just don't get the same facilities people in the bush in new south wales are underprivileged in all those areas i'm talking about no matter what electorate you go to uh just to finish off on that we did a study in the seat of um in the seat of murray during the last state election and we found that the life expectancy in murray was actually now uh i think it worked out to about t 10 months shorter now, uh, in 2017, 18, I think that was the last numbers we saw, compared to what it was 15, 10 to 15 years earlier, where people in the bush on average lived three to five years longer. So it gives you some idea of what's actually happening, that you, you are seeing country New South Wales becoming um, third world when it comes to services. I, th I think one of the other big failings, like you say, is that the political parties basically look at regional areas in regards to, well, we'll keep them happy with some trinkets. And I've, mm. I've got a pet hate for the federal government and Section 95 that allows the federal government to go around and sort of during the, the elections, like the sports rorts, um, and sort of start promising things like, you know, bullet blocks on sports grounds and that. Now, the mm. Constitution requires the Federals to look after certain areas. And I don't think our forefathers actually thought they'd be running around buying votes with, with toilet blocks at sports ground. They'd be looking at sort of um, nation-building projects, our defence, which I think is in a pretty sad state, and, and those sort of things. So I think that's one thing. But the other, even with the state government, it's still a matter of odds and end trinkets. There's no big wealth creating projects. Um, I, I'm not really familiar what uh, projects that benefit uh, regional New South Wales, but we've got things up here like in far north Queensland. We need a, a better um, economic pathway from Cairns up into the Cape, the Tablelands and the Cape. Um, a good project, a billion dollar project, would be to, to make that road there to, to enhance the economic growth within that region. Uh, in the council area, with dams are an issue, we've got the Burdigan Dam. Uh, for, for another billion dollars, we could put um, another 14 metres on top of that wall and increase the irrigation system a lot better um, and, and enhance growth. Um, so they're, they're the things that are, where the state government particularly fails at is pushing these uh, wealth creating projects and then getting, getting into the federal government for their 80% because I mean, that's mm. basically how it works. The state governments don't really have to stump up that much if, if they can come up with a good nation building or a job and wealth creation project, the federal government usually gets on board. But we, we seem to be pretty short of those uh, drive from, from Brisbane. Do you see projects within regional New South Wales that could not only be a benefit to the regions, but the state as a whole and maybe the nation that, that's being overlooked? 
Oh, look, I, I'm just, while you were talking, I was just trying to think of a project that the New South Wales government, this one, and certainly the one before, uh, any major projects that they've actually, uh, they've actually sponsored or promoted that create wealth. Uh, they certainly spend a lot of money in the bush, as I said. Uh, the big thing uh, that's been going on, certainly for the last eight or nine years, is New South Wales government's been subsidising solar farms, for example. Um, <laughs> uh, that's supposed to be the big thing, um, or, or uh, sponsoring... Uh, the installation of windmill windmill farms, you know, turbines and all that rubbish. Uh, but in the end of the day, they say, oh, look, look how much money's been pumped into those. Look how many jobs they create. Well, they don't actually create any jobs. That's the bottom line. Uh, as far as uh, being economics concerned, well, you know, the people whose land they're renting, sure, they'll get some decent dollars out of it. Uh, they might be 20% of the population of the local shire. Uh, but what about the other percent, 20% of people in town? Uh, you know, if, we, if we're going to be plastering all this rubbish all over the place, you know, if we're not growing sheep, we're not growing cattle, uh, if, if crops are, you know, going to be depleted because of it in the long run, uh, and, and that these, the regional areas simply becoming uh, electricity gathering for uh, Sydney, Newcastle and Wollongong, then what about the other 80% that live in communities in those shires who, you know, they might be a stock and stage agent, they might be butchers, they might be... You know, it just goes on. The supermarket owners, um, all the people, someone that's got the local cafe, uh, all the people that supply services, the local abattoirs, all those businesses won't get one red cent of that rental money that's going into the pockets of people who own the land. So 20% will do pretty well, but the regional, 80, the other 78, 80% will simply suffer because there'll be no cash circulating anymore. And that, that situation, the more they do of it, it could only get worse. And I don't know of any... Um, wealth building programs. You talk about uh, you talk about irrigation. Um, you know we've got the uh, the Murray, Murray the whole of the you know Murrumbidgee irrigation area and all that sort of stuff, uh, and the uh, all all the all the all the irrigation up and down the Murray. We've only watched that go backwards since two thousand and seven. Uh, it's only ever gone backwards because of the allocation of large amounts of water for uh, the environment. Uh, you know water trading that's going on um you know one of the that was one of the key reasons we won the seat of murray because of helen dalton's excellent campaigning uh, on the plight of farmers uh, in in the seat of murray you know you it, it's very strange and i'm a city boy but it's very strange that you have a you have a um an irrigation system in a in a country in a in a state or a country that's drought stricken and it's got to the stage now where even with all these heavy rains that we've had in the last, well, basically two years, two and a bit years, uh, it started to really rain heavily here uh, in February last year, 2020, that we find that you still can't get a general allocation of water. It might be in some places, in some valleys, it's might be still 10%, other, va other valleys, it might still be 20 or 30%, and some small pockets, it's getting up to 60%. But in a drought, you can't get any water, no water. So, you know, you have to say, well, what the hell is happening here? Because what is happening is everybody, federal and state, both sides of, of, big, uh, of, of big parties have just used that as a, as a chicken to pluck. And they've taken away the advantages that this huge area of irrigation should be producing. It produces 20... I think off the top of my head, about twenty billion dollars a year of agricultural product, uh, and it's, you know, it will simply get worse because the water allocations now are becoming so expensive because water is being traded and speculated on. I mean, if you were a very rich superannuation fund manager and you wanted to guarantee making money, just go out and buy water futures for uh, for that area. And sit back and wait for the drought to come along and watch your, watch your money go up. Because one thing's for certain in Australia, drought. So it's, it, the whole thing's a scam. Anyway, I won't waste your time talking much. But, but uh, I, well, I, 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 apart from building roads and bridges and all the other nonsense we talked about before, sport, if, sport feels like you say, I don't know of any wealth creating program that either New South Wales, the la Labor for 16 years and this mob now for 11 years have actually, ha actually done. I, apart from solar panels and uh, and wind turbines. Yeah, um, 
I've had had uh, Jennifer Marahosi on and uh, Chris Brook from the Southern Irrigators on on this show. Uh, with Jennifer, it was we're talking about the uh, environmental river flows to sort of supposedly support the lower lakes and Coorong in uh, in South Australia, but thing is i mean she i think going back to about 2008 she wrote a paper on that and i mean it is, is an artificial environment it's not a natural environment it's, it's something that's been created as a result of putting uh, man-made barrages in there to hold hold the tidal flow back and turn those lakes into fresh water whereas no, normally they should be estuarine mm. uh, salt water um it seems it seems completely wrong I mean, I'm not an environmentalist by any means, but to me, if you're an environmentalist, you would be looking at the real environment, not the man-made environment, and trying to get that. That should be your core thing to re-establish. And then you've got the situation also with the Barmar choke. Now, because there's no dredger in that flood so off, often now, the... the red gum forests are, are flooded too frequently and that's killing the palm trees. Mm. So all this water flow thing is counterproductive if you're an environmentalist. So, I mean, that's that's one issue. And, the other, of course, the other issue with talking with Chris and that is the water allocation. And it is absurd in regards to there's so many people who own water licence or allocations have nothing to do with the land and just... Um, basically profiteering on on other people's mm. hardship and one of the other things I do notice about that there's been has been calls to try to open up and find out a public a public register for all these holders mm. so we can have a look do you, do you see it maybe as as things change and maybe as your party gets stronger and other parties get strong there will, there will be another push to try to uh, get this register public so we can just see well, who actually is the, the main yeah, well, property well, is from this well we actually uh, uh the reality is that that's that's hella dalton's and our party's policy um and uh we actually ran a bill that originated because the government's still got a majority in the lower house i mean they've got basically two seats although there's two of their people that moved to the crossbench. So technically they don't have a majority at the moment, but let's just say they have a majority. So you, you couldn't get a bill like that up in the lower house. Uh, so what we did was um, I sponsored her bill in our house or no, sorry, I think Mark Benassiak did not me. And uh, we got it through our house. We sent it to the lower house and uh, uh, they knocked it on the head. And I, so until we see a change of government um, or we see a change in leadership, um, although I don't think that would change anything. It would have to be a change of government. Um, the, we don't see that ha actually happening, the full transparency. Uh, but, it, but you're quite right. You know, our position is clear. Uh, we need to know who's got the water, where it is, how much they've got, uh, and fully open the whole thing up. And one of the reasons why the government's fighting this, of course, is that uh, a lot of their cronies and supporters are big water holders and big water speculators. And... Um, uh, if we have anything to say on it, um, that process will change uh, at the first possible opportunity, maybe after the next election, if the, this mob don't win again. But while ever the Nationals are sitting there, hand in glove with the Liberals, um, you, you won't get anything through over their dead bodies because um, there's just so much of, of dirty money. Uh, and, it, and, I, and it works at both levels too in the National Party and the Liberal Party. Uh, at the federal and state level, they're they're a, they're a bunch of bloody crooks, and they know it, and uh, they simply are not interested in uh, having all of that Pandora's box opened up so everyone can see it. You can smell it. You don't have to. You don't even have to be that far downwind. You can smell the corruption. You know, otherwise, Just, they wouldn't fight it so hard. Yeah. I mean, I sort of going into the twenty twenty election in, in Queensland, there was talk about the Bradfield scheme and. And you know, it got a, got a bit of legs and it was talked about sort of thing. But there is generally a lack of vision in regards to uh, harvesting, storing and distributing more water. Um, but I also think things like that won't get a Guernsey if, if, you, if you get more plentiful water and be able to sort of distribute it down the Murray-Darling somehow 
well, then it, it cuts down the value of these water holdings if you get a lot of cheap water into the system. So sometimes I'm worried that the nation growing, uh, building projects like that will never get a Guernsey because it's not in the interest to get cheap water. And I think it's now getting to a situation where it's not in the interest to get cheap power because there's so many rent seekers in the renewable energy system. Um, oh, look, that, that's exactly right. And so, and so that's this, no good for the public. No, absolutely. It's no good. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something you don't already know. Oh, you certainly do is they don't care. They, don't, <laughs> they do not care at all what effect it has uh, on people in the bush, as long as they can try and spin it to their electorates in Sydney. See, what's going on electorally, and it's really started, as far as I can see, back in 2015, and the federal election, uh, the last couple of federal elections have shown that moving forward that way, is that the Liberal Party are no longer a Conservative Party, okay? And, and certainly the New South Wales brand of it, uh, what they've done is they've moved on all sorts of social issues to the left, and they've done that to try and crowd the, the Labor Party and the Greens out, because in their seats, certainly in and around Sydney and Newcastle and Wollongong, the reality is that uh, that the people in those seats, they don't care what the price of electricity is. They don't care what the price of water is. I mean, it could be 10 times. It doesn't worry them. Uh, there'll always be water in Sydney. There'll always be electricity in Sydney. Uh, you know, as far as all that's concerned, they, they don't care what effect any of this policy has as far as creating wealth. All they're thinking about is, well, what as liberals do we need to do to make sure that we retain that green elitist vote that now is moving to the left and they're not voting for conservatives anymore. They're voting for liberal green moderates and the national party are following him down that track. And that's really, I think the point that you're making, the, the nationals are following him down that track because if, if the liberal party don't uh, do this, and I mean, and as I say, they've been doing it, whether it's on the animal rights agenda, whether it's on water agenda, whether it's on, you name it, uh, whether it's on social right right to life issues, whether it's on, um, you know, uh, abortion law, doesn't matter what it is. In New South Wales now, the Liberal Nationals have moved in to crowd out the Labor Party and the Greens policy. They've taken it all out because come the next election, they have to make sure that they are able to retain the elites in their North Shore and Eastern Suburbs seats especially. And it, where, Labor it, would never have had a chance in those seats anyway, but the point is they were they are being attacked by green independents. Uh, the Zali Steggles of this world, okay? Zali Steggle. The, the proliferation of minor um, percentage-wise group and their influence on the media and the political sphere, from Extinction Rebellion to animal rights, to Peter, to uh, transgender people, uh, causes and stuff like that. Do you think a lot of that's the ability to sort of uh, those influences, those small, very small groups of people to influence the major parties is mainly because the average Australian is so apathetic about what's going on and doesn't take any notice and sort of, you know, they'll, they'll just vote for anyone anyway, as long as it's in that and they won't protest against the going down on one course of the road to satisfy these uh, minority lo lobby groups. Well, look, I think, look, I think, uh, Australians, Australians are no more apathetic than anybody else and anywhere else in the world when it comes to voting. Um, but I think, I, I think that uh, certainly if you take the animal rights agenda, I mean, right now in New South Wales, we are in the midst of a campaign where the New South Wales government and the Minister for Agriculture and Western New South Wales, Adam Marshall, is sponsoring a bill to get rid of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, which has been an, an act in parliament that's been there for 40 or 50 years in its current form and replace it with an animal rights act. So they're still gonna call it POCTA, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, but what they are gonna do is introduce, throw out the old, and no case has been made why it's no good, except that the Liberal Party have done a deal with the animal justice people 
to get pr preferences at the next state election because animal justice gets 90% of its votes in Sydney. Okay, that's, that's really all it's about. And so they're prepared to introduce the five freedoms of animals, bring the likes of PETA, animal liberation, uh, voiceless, and all that mob of fringe dwellers and introduce a bill into the New South Wales Parliament that will give animals rights that humans don't even have. That's what it gets down to. I mean, it's just mind boggling. And when we tell people about this, it'll take away your right to farm in the long term. It'll take away your right to fish. It'll take away your right to hunt. You won't be able to, you can't even have working dogs. The whole thing is just topsy turvy and completely crazy. And this is being pushed by the National Party and it will absolutely over 10, 20 years, if you combine that with what uh, is happening with the climate change agenda uh, in, in, in New South Wales, rural and regional areas, you know, you and I will be dead, but who knows what will be left in 30 years from now or 40 years from now, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 the mind boggles, but anyway, getting back to, to that, that stuff, that Pocter thing, we're in the midst of a campaign right now. And if you said to me, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago that we'd be talking about animal rights law in New South Wales becoming the law of how you are, are meant to everybody, from you, me, down to children, down to farmers, as I said, fishos, everybody, that that would be within 10 years law, uh, that the psychological condition of a lobster is, will be considered uh, in whether you're being cruel to it or not. Uh, I'm, I kid you not, uh, you know, I, I, I just said, oh, you're mad. That's what people say to me today in the middle of our campaign. They say, oh, you're just exaggerating. Well, they sit down and read it, go through it all. You know, there's a discussion paper on the DPI website. It's written, it's, <laughs> it's you know, th there's a section in there that talks about the minister will be appointing or has the would want and have the ability to appoint any and all organisations who may have the qualification financing or background to be able to go out and help them police this act because in new south wales the rspca and the animal welfare league already do it but because this is going to be in such a big job prosecuting and persecuting every person that's got an animal in new south wales and you've got to get all over in new south wales and get stuck into all the farmers uh, they're going to need a lot more people out there so they'll get peter involved they'll get animal animal uh, animals australia they'll get the animal liberation people involved and, and you talk to you talk to um, uh, some people in some of the uh, some of the organisations, like the Fishing Tackle Association, and people like that. They say, oh, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. It's not going to be like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then <laughs> you you read the discussion paper and tell me why or how are they going to administer it when they going when they say in there that the five freedoms of animals. Anyone listening to that? Just Google that up. Have a look at it. Have a read of it. Uh, they're going to change the definition of harm to include the psychological harming of animals. And keep in mind, a pippy will be defined as an animal, okay? Uh, a, a prawn, um, a lobster, crustaceans for the first time, cephalopods, octopus and squids, they're all going to be brought in as well. Now, how do you not harm a octopus if you want to catch it, kill it and eat it? How do I, you know, you, you can't do it. They say, oh, but you've got a defence. No, no. It's not about defence, you know. It's not about defence. The, pr the the prosecution of you and issuing of a fine in these things is where the real persecution is. We've seen it in the greyhound racing industry in New South Wales already. So, you know, this is um, this this is just crazy stuff because the animal justice people they get they got one point nine two percent of the whole statewide vote last time. Ninety percent of it was in Sydney. So that's what it's all about. The Liberal Party and the National Party are prepared to sell out this state for and farmers and farming in all rural and regional areas of the whole, whole of New South Wales to try and buy a few animal justice votes at the next state election for the Liberals. <laughs> the Nationals won't get a single vote out of it. It's for the Liberals. But the Nationals, because they're in that... In that um, uh, Adam Marshall is the minister for agriculture in brackets fisheries as well and western new south wales he has to run this thing so he's running it on behalf of the animal justice party and i don't hear any i don't hear mr barillaro saying anything about it i don't hear any of the nationals jumping up and down about it 
shooters, fishers and farmers are the only ones out there campaigning against it. And we'll beat it. We're going after them like you wouldn't believe. We, well, there's a, a million fish shows in New South Wales. People that go fishing, freshwater. They're, they're after them. There's a quarter of a million shooters out there after them. There's God knows how many farmers and farming communities out there. Everyone, by the time we're finished, is going to know what they're up to. I, don't, I just don't see how the National Party think that they could ever get away with this. I mean, in, in 2018, they tried to ban recreational fishing in August 2018. Uh, by setting up 23 new marine parks in one go. One go, 23 new marine parks. They called them marine reserves, but they were marine parks. And including the whole of Sydney Harbour, shut down, gone, finish. We campaigned with the fishers on that. Uh, and, and luckily, by the time we, from August through till Christmas, bang, it was dead. But this is the sort of nonsense that goes on. This is city-centric policy driven by the Liberals to guarantee their safety uh, and the Nationals are the little tail at the end of the dog, just wogging along and following suit, doing as they're told. I, 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 it's, it's just mind boggling, I tell you, mind boggling. And that's- and I thought that's, it was just bad, bad enough with the Vegetation Management Act and those sort of oh. things and anti-logging and this, this, this allowing uh, locking up of land is ridiculous. I mean, all, all land in Australia, should deliver a dividend for the people of Australia, whether it's owned by the pub, you know, a, a, as a private person, he, he um, arms it or, or he, he puts something on it to, to derive an income from himself, his community, or the nation. But th this business of going in and buying up land and just simply locking it up, like a lot of these NGOs, like the wildlife funds and the uh, and conservation funds buying up land, just locking it up. To me, it's basically criminal in regards to lock it up, walk away, and they don't manage it. So the feral animals, the noxious weeds just continue to grow at hand and they don't, they don't do anything to the land. They don't put go inside it. They don't have a fire plan. They don't, don't have a uh, feral animal plan. It's just left, left to go. And, and that to me is, is, is not what land is about. You know, it's, it's part of Australia, it's, it should, should be deriving a benefit. I mean, if you've got pristine, if you've got pristine forests or you know, some, some think of uh, national importance sort of thing, it delivers a, a benefit either by amenity or, or prestige. Uh, other land should, should deliver a benefit either being mined, armed or, or or put, put something on it, and of course, there's, you know, there's also a lot of land that probably can't do much with unless you get water. Well, that should be one of the focus you would think of the Australian government and the federal government on on our dry continent, harvest more water and send it where it can be used and and where the where the public and the nation can benefit. But it doesn't seem well, that, to be any, that's, any sort that's of priority. The productive use of water is the last priority. You know, if you're in the uh, Murray-Darling Basin, uh, you now have the New South Wales sold their 50% of the uh, the hydro system back to the feds while Turnbull was there. And now they're going to take a bunch of that water and turn it into what they call their big battery, you know, which is which is nonsensical concept because all the water in the whole system has been allocated. It's allocated. So they're going to need to keep at least a certain level of water in those high dams to go in and out, in and out, in and out, up and down the turbines. Uh, where's that water allocation going to come from? Who's going to own that water? Uh, are they going to take that water away from farming again? Or are they going to take it from the environment? Or are they just going to somehow rather play ducks and drakes and pretend that the water uh, is there and will remain there? Because there'll be a certain chunk of water, very large amount of water in those high dams that will not be allowed to be released for any purpose. Because guess what? It's got to supply electricity for Sydney. You know, I mean, producing food... And fibre in the Murray-Darling Basin is the last thing now that water is for. You know, it's for, it's for speculators. It's for generating electricity. Uh, who else? Who else has a go? Everyone else has a go. Guess what? Farmer comes last. Farmer comes last. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, it's... We certainly, yeah. we certainly haven't, haven't had any nation building projects 
for a long time. Well, we're, and... we're, li we're living off the goodwill of the past, you know. I mean, the, the, mm. the, the irrigation system there was set, first got started in uh, after World War One, so it's, uh, it's well over 100 years old. And, and uh, you know... It, it is very disappointing that we have no people of vision, no parties, you know, no parties in power with vision. Um, it's just a matter of just keeping going through the election cycle and, and that that's the whole that's the whole aim of the situation. I think I think this is doing the nation a great disservice. Um, when as we go forward, um, it, you know, we've sort of discussed it anyway. Um, the disparity between the wants and needs of the people in the high population areas and the people in regional Australia. Uh, um, is it becoming so different that we maybe need to actually think about separate separate states? I've, I mean, we're seeing seeing five zads <laughs> in the last few weeks. I want to say too many states just because he threw a tantrum because Western Australia didn't play the play ball with him. I mean, that's a nonsensical thing proposition because a you'd have to basically suspend the constitution to do that and. Uh, basically doing half the job of the, mm. the, the new world order by <laughs> facilitating the centralization of power in Australia by your, own, by your own volition sort of thing. So that's, 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 that's a silly sort of move. But the Constitution does provide in Chapter 6 for new states. And I think our forefathers always envisaged there would be, as, as time passed and regional areas grew, that they would, would separate and become new states, just as way as New South Wales was a, the original colony, it became Van Diemen's Land or Tasmania, and another piece got broken off to uh, South Australia, another piece to Victoria, and then finally the last piece broke off in 1859 to Queensland. We should so, have kept it all. We should have just kept it all. <laughs> <laughs> and and no, had no. Really. I don't even know. I don't even know why Canberra's there. I mean, it's just a, a useless gap fest, as far as I'm concerned. Well, that that's the way the federation was created. I mean, yeah, we've got I the constitution, but the but the thing is, we need to use it. But there's a provision there in Chapter Six to create new states. If, if you imagine, say, New South Wales split, western divide and and eastern divide sort of thing and and the western divide was a separate state they would have a completely different set of priorities as a people a government and that move forward than the people on the uh east side of the divide uh, and same thing in queensland if you split queensland into two states from say gladstone up with the um people that million people in central and north queensland would have a completely different set of priorities and outlook and needs than what comes out of southeast queensland do you see see a future in regards to well if the... well, look, I, I think i think the reality is uh, in new south wales west of the west of the blue mountains so um but there's just not enough population critical mass there anymore to do anything like that uh, you know you've got as i said you look at the seat of bar and it's the size of belgium uh it's it's got 55 56 thousand voters uh, and uh, it goes from the north queensland border all uh, it's the south australian border down to uh, the victorian border just about so it and then you've got yeah you know, you've got the uh, other seats i just don't see that that's even contemplatable now definitely the requirements of people in uh, in rural and regional areas are different there's no question of that um but what we're seeing is uh, a continual erosion of those people's rights when it comes to having you know the same education as you get in sydney they have as i said before the same health outcomes uh the same mental health outcomes the same you know this even this opportunity for wealth etc um it's very much, and it probably has probably always been that way, but now it's a lot more apparent the the, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots, and um, is is uh, that people in the bush are entitled to have the same, if not more, or better than what uh, you get in Sydney, but because the, the difference now, I mean Sydney's approaching, or Greater Sydney's approaching, 
I think about uh, six and a half to seven million people. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's very hard to resist that when it comes to, to, um, to, to the government of the day seeking to maximise its votes in that, in that area. And like you, you, you said before we got started, you've got Newcastle there. Um, it's still going reasonably well. It's still a large regional centre, but it's basically a large, uh, large and growing uh, metropolis as well. And Wollongong, similar down south. Um, you know, we, we need to re-establish the steel industry, for example. That needs to be done. Um, we, you know, we came very close a few years ago losing uh, our steel making facility here in, uh, down at Port Kembla. Um, all of these, these things need to be thought through. Um, what are we prepared to throw away? I mean, we don't, we don't have a domestic oil industry anymore. We don't refine petrol uh, in Australia anymore. I think the two or three refineries we've had here in New South Wales have all been closed. Um, how long are we going to continue to do this sort of thing? We don't even have 19 days supply of fuel. No, that's right. You know, um, <laughs> we don't have a strategic supply of, of anything. So, and we've got we've got the the Chinese communists breathing down our throat. You know, uh, if they think that we're going to roll over to them, they got another thing coming. You know, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, well, you know. we we probably need a little bit more focus on our military and 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 people. Uh, maybe go along the way of Switzerland where every every civilian has, you know, firearms and that, and it's part of the, the National Defence Force type thing because, we're, we're, because oh. we're such a low population. Well, look, I don't agree with much with what Morrison does, uh, even less with Labor, but um, I think the reality is that uh, uh, buying nuclear submarines is a damn bloody good idea. The only thing that would be better is to nuclear put nuclear warheads in them, and uh, and float them around off the Chinese coast. And if they want to have a go at us, well, cop this. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you know, I lived through the Cold War. You did too. And uh, you know what kept the Russians at bay? You know, we know what that was. Deterrent. So, deterrence. And unless we have a uh, a viable deterrence, it's got through the thick skulls of people in Canberra um, some time ago, and that's good. Uh, you know, what he's pulled off, I think, uh, from that point of view is fantastic. All that we need to do now is make sure we get a bunch of two or three British or American nuclear killer, killer subs um, stationed here in Australia between now and when we start rolling off the new ones in, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now, um, our own. <laughs> yeah. fine, fine with me. Um. Just going forward to the next election, um, you've made those grounds in the basically the far west. Do you see seats in that uh, surrounding or adjoining those current seats that may come into play with uh, for your party based on uh, the, the results of the last election and the general trend for the low, low primary votes of the, the major parties? Is, is there any uh, targets you'd like me to have? Look, we're, uh, at, the, uh, at the last state election, we ran in 26 lower house seats out of 92. Um, at the next state election in uh, March 2023, our aim is to run in about 50 seats. Um, and if you said, well, you know, which ones can we win? Well, obviously, we want to retain what we've got. Uh, that's always a battle, but we will hopefully be successful with that. Uh, what country seats do we want to target? Well, I think we'll be basically targeting them all. And I think the Nationals got about 15 seats left. Um, they had, I think they had, they had 18, I think they might be down to 14. I can't remember exactly. But anyway, we'll target all of them. Plus we'll target uh, a number of others to make sure we get up around the, the 50 mark. And um, which seats are possible? Well, perhaps uh, Upper Hunter is possible. We we ran in the by-election earlier this year in Upper Hunter before all this current level of lockdowns occurred. Um, it was Labor, National Party. Um, that traditionally was a National Party seat. Um, One Nation and ourselves were really the four major parties that ran in that election. And um, we, ca we came third. Um, and it was basically our vote got split because we'd run in the previous election as well and our vote got split 
between ourselves and one nation and uh, a lot of one nation's votes wasted so we couldn't get on top of it's not it's not compulsory preferential so uh, a lot of people would have voted for one nation then didn't vote for us but a, a number did um, we had almost e exactly the same primary vote when the uh, when preferences were allocated we came in third and one nation were a distant fourth so uh, but we think that uh, we're definitely going to have another crack we think we've got a chance there after the redistribution that came through a couple of months ago that seats notionally about a half a percent majority for the nationals that's all so uh yeah if i can cut a deal with one nation well we'll get we might see something done mightn't we you know there's no point in us running against one another no the the federal election of course is coming up um uh, probably they'll probably keep it back until last minute maybe uh may may next year's the last they can do it do you look like will you be running say a senate candidate for senate candidates and maybe the odd uh, federal seat yeah look our plan at the moment is that we will run um we will definitely run a senate ticket um uh, here in new south wales maybe in victoria maybe in western australia maybe maybe even in queensland um it's very, very hard to win a Senate seat. Uh, we know that. Um, and we may run again a couple of uh, lower house seats in New South Wales as, as well. But look, there are seats that, you know, on the paper might be useful for us to run hard in. But the trouble is that <clears throat> we don't have the dollars to spend on campaigns. Uh, at the state level in New South Wales, what, you can, what, you, what people can donate to you is capped and what you can spend on an election is capped. At the federal level, everything's uncapped. And so we know that uh, there's been huge amounts of money tipped into national party seats, uh, pork barreling those getting ready for the uh, election uh, to think that you're just going to turn up and we reckon we can run a, a very professional campaign. I mean, that's been one of our strengths, uh, but we, I don't think we've got the dollars to really go toe to toe with the nationals or the or any country liberals out there, but we definitely are going to have a crack at a couple of seats at, at the in the in the uh, in the lower house. We'll just have to see what 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 happens at the time. A lot of it's also driven by the the type of and quality of candidates we have. Getting good getting good candidates, quality candidates, uh, is as you know very very difficult. Yeah, well, it's a pretty <laughs> for all all the angst that people have about politicians. I'm, I don't see too many people stand standing up for a seven day, uh, 24 hour a day job uh, <laughs> with uh, little time to yourself. I think they'd much rather be the CEO of some council with, with a um, first class tickets or business class tickets everywhere, um, an expense account and pick it up with twice as much as a backbencher and but maybe turn up to work at ten o'clock and go home by four, and uh, basically has got no has got no real job other than uh, make sure everything's done to a set standard set of procedures and rules. So I think I think there's a lot cushier jobs than being a politician. Look, I and mean, better pay. That's right. Look, I think politicians are generally held in rather low regard in Australia, and certainly in New South Wales they are, um, but. You know, it's not a job that's overpaid. Um, uh, you really have to, certainly, certainly the major parties there are career politicians. Um, there's no one in our party, our small party, that are career politicians that came up through that. All of them had, have had previous lives, all have had previous jobs, whether it's Helen Dalton, who's a farmer, whether it's uh, Phil Donato, who was a police prosecutor in Orange, um, whether it's Roy Butler, who was a, uh, a uh, public servant working and he used to work that whole electorate. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing um, to find good people. And you really, you really have to have a passion to try to do something. And I think it's working on the passion to help people in the bush that's really got us a bit of an edge. Um, I think also running good campaigns. Um, we run a very professional team. Um, yeah, it's... But, it, but it's hard. It's not easy. And uh, when you've got limited dollars, which we have, uh, we don't have access to the government's pork barrel. Um, also, from a media point of view, um, the focus on COVID has pretty much shut down all other media for the last nearly two years. Um, 
and even before that um it's very very hard for us as a, our party to get any sort of coverage um uh, from the media certainly in sydney they, they we've been blackballed in sydney we don't get anything uh, but we don't we're not too much worried about that because our, our appeals out the bush so anytime we do anything <clears throat> it's always the projection is into the uh, into the regions and i think i think we get some reasonable coverage there just before we finish up just just going forward for other states like queensland victoria and i don't know how how much influence uh how you developed in uh the other states you you look like you're going forward in uh say queensland or uh, Victoria over the over the, say the next five years or so. Well, we've we've had a presence in the parliament in Victoria for well probably the last six or seven years. <clears throat> They've got an election coming up. We'll stand stand again. Um, and we've got one one member there in the lower house at the last election. We had two the election before. Um, we'll go again. Um, we had a uh, we had a member in in, in Western Australia for a couple of electoral cycles he only just got chucked out in this last one because the COVID election over there pretty much wiped everybody out um so you know we'll, we'll come back there again um we we have a party in queensland um but they've traditionally not done too well um we're always looking for good people in queensland so if you if anyone wants to join us they're welcome to um but yeah we we have got a we have got a you know more than just new south wales focus um but the different electoral systems in each state some are more favorable some are less favorable to minor parties and uh, i think uh i think we've got a branding that's good i think we've got a message that's good um it's just a matter of how we go about uh getting that across to people in the bush that we can actually do something and make a difference and i think us having three lower house seats keep in mind in new south wales there's only three greens in the lower house so you know we've done it um in, in really one and a half electoral cycles we've got we've had th three in it took the greens 20 years to do that uh because uh, of what's of what they've done uh with their politics over the years with labor um the party that's in in decline in, in new south wales certainly in the regions is is labor but so is the national party so uh, the nationals have lost since the 2019 election They've lost, uh, I think, four seats in the lower house. So they, they, they are shrinking. And if I have anything to do about it at the next election or do with it, they're going to lose a couple more. Yeah. <laughs> well, we wish you all the best uh, at replacing people who don't look after our regions. Um, well, they, they should be the first to go, and especially those pretenders who, who say that they are looking after us and basically do nothing for us. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time tonight. We'll wind up there. If you can just stay on the line for a while, I'll just introduce uh, next week's show and then come back to you, Robert. Okay, thank you. If you enjoyed tonight's show, please follow, like, and subscribe to our Facebook pages and subscribe to our YouTube page. Next week, we'll have Jim us on. Now, Jim is the chairman of the Hewington Irrigation Project. Now that's a, that's a project uh, on the Flinders in the Flinders uh, Shire to divert water to enhance irrigation. So it's a novel scheme, and we'll hear from Jim and his and uh, some of the farmers up there in regards to this project and and its long-term benefits. But join me again next week for that show. <laughs>